Immanuel Kant. A little background information, and then we'll take a look at his um, view of the philosophy of religion. He was born in Konigsberg, East Prussia, on April 22nd, 1724. He was born into a Pietist family, and Pietism is a Protestant sect that endorses a severe puritanical lifestyle, and they emphasize faith and religious feelings over reason and theological doctrines. Kant himself attended the University of Konigsberg as a student and later became a professor. According to physical descriptions, he was about five feet tall, frail, and thin. He knew much about geography in the events of his time, but apparently never traveled more than 60 miles from home. He helped his brother and sisters financially, but was apparently not particularly close to them. He was known for being extremely orderly, so much so that the locals set the watches by their daily walk. And there's a story that one day that he failed to show up on his walk on, on time and people were very concerned and ran to see what was the matter. And according to the story, he had become so interested in a book that he failed to, you know, to go on his normal walk. And he promised that he would always um, walk at his normal time, again, to avoid, avoid um, causing so much concern. The place that he walked is still known to this day as the Philosopher's Walk. And you could go there, well, I guess when the pandemic's over, uh, go there and walk the Philosopher's Walk. He had friends, but later became a recluse, retired from public lecturing in 1797, and died on February 12th, 1804, and is, of course, still dead today. People who get paid to talk about Kant and specialize in him regard him as extremely important in philosophy. He contributed to metaphysics, logic, aesthetics, theology, math, physics, geography, and anthropology. And, again, those who... Um, are paid to specialize in Kant, he's regarded as revolutionizing philosophy. And they regard his impact as so important that some of the people, especially those who get you know, paid to specialize in Kant, divide philosophy into pre-Kantian and post-Kantian phases. We'll see more of our good dead friend talking about his ethics, but now we turn to his arguments regarding God. Now, much like our good dead friend Pascal, who we'll conclude this section with, he contends that reason cannot be used to prove the existence of God. And he claims that there are three ways you might try to do so. These include an a priori ontological argument, as per St. Anselm, uh, Descartes and Leibniz also um, had similar arguments that are based on the idea of a perfect being. The second is the cosmological argument, essentially the creation argument. Can't get something from nothing, got a universe, uh, got to be created by something, and this is God. And lastly, the teleological argument, or the argument from design, which is very crudely put. You look at the universe, it's designed. You can have no design without a designer, and the only being that could possibly design the universe would be God. And Kant claims that each proof fails. Now, I've mentioned the argument by elimination in, in the uh, past, but the question is, um, you know, exactly what is the form? And as I mentioned before, there's essentially two forms of the argument by elimination. Form one, we could call the Sherlock method. And the argument works like this. The idea is that you only have so many possibilities. And if you can eliminate all the possibilities but one, and you know that those are all the possibilities, what remains must be the correct answer. And I call that the Sherlock method because you can see this is like how a detective would work. If you have five suspects uh, for a crime, and you know that one of them did it, and you eliminate four, then it must be the one remaining that was not eliminated. And more formally, you would have the following argument. Premise 1, the only possibilities are P, Q, or R. Premise 2, P and Q have been eliminated. Conclusion, it must be R. Naturally, you could have more than three options, but the idea is you have so many options, 
you eliminate all but one, the one remaining must be the correct one. Now what Khan is doing though is an argument to annihilation, or as the Daleks would say, extermination. So premise one, the only possibilities for something, for X, are P, Q, or R. Premise two, P, Q, and R have been eliminated. Conclusion, there is no possibility of X. So in the case of, you know, the God arguments, Kant's saying the only possibilities to argue for God are the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, or the teleological argument. None of them work. All three have been eliminated, so there's no possibility of arguing for God. So how does he make this happen? How does he try to show that the arguments fail? Well, it begins with the ontological argument. So the ontological argument, at least in Kant's reformulation, goes like this. First step, I can conceive of a perfect being. The conceivable is possible. It is possible that a perfect being exists, and if a perfect being exists, then it has all perfections. Existence is a perfection. So if a perfect being exists, then it has existence. It's possible that a perfect being necessarily exists, and it would be absurd to claim there could be something whose non-existence is impossible, at the same time its non-existence is possible. Thus, a perfect being must exist of necessity. So he's kind of, you know, smushing together all the various ontological arguments. And again, the gist of the ontological arguments is always essentially that God is perfect, so he's got to exist, because if he didn't exist, he wouldn't be perfect, but he is, so he does. So how does Kant refute the ontological argument? Well, here's his first refutation. He does agree that the concept of God includes a concept of an absolute necessary being. He then compares this with the nature of a triangle. If something is a triangle, then it must have three angles. Now, this does not inform us whether triangles exist or not. If you deny there are triangles, then you do not need to affirm there are three-angled figures. But, of course, if there are, if there are triangles, then there would be three-angled figures. So, by analogy, if there is a god then there is an entity that exists by necessity. But if one denies there is a God, then one may also deny there is a necessary being. So he's trying to deny that you can go from concepts to existence. Now, the triangle example often kind of doesn't have a lot of, a lot of bite because people say, but, but I know triangles exist. So let's try something sillier. So... Let's take the Billigon, a billion-sided figure. Now, we know by definition, if there is a Billigon, then it must have a billion sides. And I'm just making this up, of course. And you can honestly say we don't know whether there is such a thing or not. There could be an entire universe totally devoid of Billigons. And so we can deny there are Billigons, while at the same time accepting that of necessity, they have a billion sides by definition. So that works out. His second refutation is this. He claims that existence is not a predicate. In philosophy, also, um, you know, English classes, we talk about subject predicate. Subject, what you're talking about. Predicate is a quality attributed to it. So if you say, like, uh, the bar is gold... The bar is the subject, what you're talking about, and being gold is the predicate, the quality. So he says that existence is not a property that adds to the concept of a thing. For example, thinking of a bar of gold is indistinguishable from thinking of an existing bar of gold. So if existence is not a property, then it cannot be an essential part of the concept of God. And he draws an analogy by saying that arguing from our concept of God to God's existence is like a merchant adding zeros to his cash balance and supposing his wealth is thus increasing. Now, as far as existence not being a property, I'll use a 
my usual silly example to try to you know show that Kant is you know, probably right about this. Imagine if someone asked me, you know, what sort of car I drove. And I said, well, I have a, um, you know, one of the brand new uh, Teslas. It's got all the, you know, most expensive options, you know, Dolby surround sound. It's got uh, everything, you know, handmade Corinthian leather seats. And any option you could think of, I've got on there. No expense spared. But unfortunately, because I spent so much money on everything else, I couldn't afford the last option, namely existence. But it's an amazing car. It just lacks the property of existence. And of course, that would be, be ridiculous because existence is not a quality or property a thing has. Things exist and they have qualities, but it's not a quality things have. And so Kant's argument does seem pretty pretty reasonable. So... If existence is not a property, then the ontological argument, at least as Kant sees it, runs into trouble. So to his satisfaction, he believes he's defeated the ontological argument. As you might imagine, not everyone agrees with him, and there are those who do argue against his argument. The second argument is the cosmological argument. This is as follows. This argument goes from the existence of stuff that needs a cause to the existence of an ultimate or final cause, which must of necessity exist. You know, again, the gist of it is you can't get something for nothing. You must have a being that um, must exist, and this being is God. Since we get something rather than nothing, we get God. Now, as Kant sees it, this argument rests on the principle that every event has a cause. And Kant gets rather... Humean here. He argues the principle can only apply within the realm of experience and cannot apply to what lies beyond experience. And since we don't experience, you know, the creation of the world, the argument can't can't succeed because of the limits of our experience. He also contends that by referring to a necessary being, it also runs into the same problem as the ontological argument. So he thinks it's kind of a double fail. So as he sees it, the, the cosmological argument fails it well as well. So that would be so far two arguments down, as far as you know, Kant believes. The final argument type is the teleological argument. This argument is also known as the argument from design. And the idea is, is this. You look at the universe around you, there seems to be evidence of an ordered universe, and from this, one infers that there's design, there must be a designer, this designer must be God. Now Kant really, really, really likes this argument. He claims that it is the oldest, the clearest, and the most accordant with the common sense of mankind. He also suggests that it motivates scientists to look for connections within nature, and that each discovery strengthens the proof. So why doesn't he say, yep, you know, this one works? Well, Here's the problem. Again, it's the limits of experience. He claims that the argument can, at most, establish that a designer imposed order on pre-existing matter. And this is the view we saw when we talked about the ancient Greeks, when you're talking about Leibniz and the problem of evil. So Kant thinks this is pretty good. So he does accept there's got to be something designing the matter. But to establish the creator of everything would require the cosmological argument. But he believes the cosmological argument fails. So ontological argument fails, the cosmological argument fails, the teleological argument fails according to Kant. So where does this leave us? Well, according to Kant, it leaves us here. He says that all attempts to prove the existence of God are, to quote him, altogether fruitless and by their nature, null and void. He contends that his arguments also show that it's impossible to prove that God does not exist. So the theist who claims to know God exists cannot claim this. And the atheist who claims God does not exist cannot claim to have knowledge of this. So somewhat like Hume, he turns to the matter of faith. Now, unlike Hume, Kant is 
clearly very serious about this as an option. So he claims that the failure of reason here, the failure of the arguments, leaves open the possibility for basing religion on practical or moral faith. And he claims that his goal in his work, The Critique, is, to quote him, deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. So Kant says, even though the arguments all fail, it ends up being a two-edged sword, namely that it defeats the claim that we can know that God exists from rational proof, but it also defeats the claim that we can know that God doesn't exist based on rational proof. But there is still room for knowledge um, based on faith, or rather just faith, depending on whether you want to categorize faith as knowledge or, or not. And so that takes us to the end of Immanuel Kant talking about the arguments for God. Next, we'll look at our good dead friend, Blaise Pascal. Although his name sounds appropriate for an action hero or a porn star, he is actually a French philosopher talking about God and stuff. So, in our next exciting episode, Blaise Pascal. <laughs>